Shanghai and the first venue for a sprint in the 2024 Formula One season. China is a country that the series hasn't visited since 2019 and in the time in between we've got a whole new generation of cars and that means the circuit is something completely new to every team essentially and new to a quarter of the grid in terms of drivers as well. So there's an awful lot to learn so it's not a normal place to bring upgrades considering it's on the other side of the world to the team's European bases as well. However, there are some upgrades on display up and down the pit lane. But before we get into that, I thought it's worth noting Craig Scarborough and Tina Gade having a discussion about how the teams have prepared to come to this very unpredictable and very different race circuit this year. It's well worth having a look at that on F1 TV. But meanwhile, I thought we'd take a look at some of the upgrades, as I mentioned. But the first upgrades I want to take a look at are perhaps some of the most secret in Formula One, yet it's the power unit. This is a 2021 Honda RA621H power unit that propelled the Red Bull team throughout the 2021 season. Now, power unit development and power unit upgrades are officially banned in Formula One. But that's not the full story. Before we get into that, I thought it'd be worth taking a look at the overall layout out of the power unit because we don't normally get to get such good pictures here shot beautifully at the Japanese Grand Prix by one of our camera operators. And I think it's well worth just taking a deeper look at the layout of the car. The most obvious thing that jumps out to you, of course, this is a V6 engine. You can see the injector tops there. There's three on each side. It's a V6 engine, 90 degree V angle and in the middle of that V is something you can't really see and we'll come to that in a moment but because it's a V6 engine you've got a bank of exhausts on either side there you can see them in their thermal insulation cover one pipe for each cylinder they merge together and then go into the turbine of the turbocharger and you can see the turbine located at the back of the engine block here now this is quite an interesting layout this is a layout that was introduced by Mercedes sometimes nicknamed the Pegasus layout after the Rolls-Royce jump jet engine, but actually it's something Mercedes introduced right back in the 2014 season. And now every other team has evolved towards, with the exception, I believe, of Ferrari, where you have the turbocharger split in two. So you have the turbine at the back of the block where all the hot stuff is, and the compressor is located at the front of the engine block where it's all a bit cooler and you can get cooler air into where you want it to be. And that gives you a little bit of a performance increase. But what's missing? Well, you've got the MGUH, the motor generator heat that is located in between the two halves of the turbocharger in that V of the block in the 90 degree V. It's all on a common shaft because the regulations force it to be that way. And it's a really clever piece of packaging for a big old electric motor. Keeping the temperatures and the vibrations of that motor in the right area is a really tricky thing to do. But the teams all seem to be pretty much mastering that now. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is the other electric motor in you see on all Formula One cars. That's located just down here. It's the MGUK just underneath the left exhaust bank. That's a pretty common location on all of the power units now. And it's a big old electric motor, quite heavy, but kicking out some serious horsepower. In 2026, that unit is gonna get much, much bigger and much, much more potent. And it's gonna be interesting to see how the teams decide to package that. We haven't seen any of those new generation of power units that where fossil fuels have been banned as well. That's gonna be really exciting to see how the teams manage that. But the MGU-Hs that sit in the middle, they're all being outlawed as is the split turbo layout you see here on the Honda power unit. So that's an interesting thing as well. But taking a look further forward, you can see the battery pack. This is something, again, we don't normally get to see because this is usually located deep in the back of the monocoque, deep in the back of the chassis of the car, underneath the fuel cell which sits on top. Now this is split into two essentially. You see this section on top that's bolted on quite clearly. This section here isn't just a lid for the battery cells, the control electronics, so that's one of those limited components you hear us describing quite often, that's all located in the top of the batteries pack here, mostly. There's a few other bits that you might be located around different bits of the car as well, but that's where most teams locate their control electronics. Then underneath is the energy store, one of those other limited components, and that's all the battery cells that sit inside here. And this is an area that a lot of teams have struggled for reliability with. You're only allowed two energy stores for the season and two sets of control electronics, and some drivers have already used up their full allocation for the season, and we're only at the fifth race of the season. So penalties could be coming 
for that. Now, if you want to understand a little bit more about what goes on inside these battery packs, these energy stores, well, Craig Scarborough, I know, is going to take a very detailed look at that in a future race. It's really fascinating content. I've seen some of it already. I guarantee you it's worth watching. Then just taking a little bit of a better look around the back of the power unit here, you can see very clearly the turbine, that hot bit. You can see where the exhaust is coming in here and you can just see how Honda is managing that part of the car. Pretty consistent design overall when you look at it. The real devil in these power units though, in this generation power unit, is in the detail and the details on them are just beautiful. I thought I'd just show you this shot because I like it. Um, similar situation here, nice view of the compressor and a lovely view of the turbine at the back. So those are the upgrades you can't really see, but when I say upgrades, this is a 2021 power unit. Well, I've taken a deep look in some documentation that shows me how Honda have developed their power unit since 2014, and the changes are absolute and fundamental to the layout of this power unit. I mean, yes, it's still a 90 degree V6, but pretty much everything else on it has changed. Even the crankshaft height has been mucked about with. Everything is pretty tight on these power units and has been pretty fundamentally changed as well. But the regulations say at the moment you can't develop your power unit. New generation of engines and power units coming in 2026, but there is a little loophole. Teams are allowed to change their power unit for reasons of reliability, safety, or cost. And reliability is the big one there because with the power units expected to last a little bit longer than they ever have done before this season with 24 races and the same number of power units that are allocated per driver, it is a bit tight for the teams to make it to the end of the season without having to go a bit further on each unit without incurring a penalty. So the teams would be able to change pretty much every component of the power unit without incurring a penalty or get around that regulation that says you can't develop the power unit unless it's reliability. Well, it's got to go further so you can change everything for the reasons of reliability. And if it brings you a bit of performance, ah, so what? Well, up and down the pit lane, the four power unit manufacturers have been incredibly reluctant to detail exactly what they've changed on the power unit. And they've all sort of said, yeah, we can change stuff for reliability, but it's like definitely only reliability. There's no performance to come from it. And to give you an example of that reluctance to chat about it, Jock Clear had a quick word with us in the pit lane just a couple of races ago. Power unit is, is much more fixed in terms of what you're able to do. Uh, reliability is always important and we saw this race last year we came here with with an engine penalty straight away so you see the impact of not being on top of reliability that's somewhere we worked obviously clearly over the over the last year and that's paying off uh, we've, we've not had any any issues with the power unit gearbox is working fine and all of these things are again incremental changes the regulations haven't changed so we're just looking for fine detail and and as I say at this level fine detail matters of course, that's all about the upgrades that you can't see. There are still quite a lot of upgrades you can see on display in the pit lane in Shanghai. And the one that everybody's talking about is, of course, the upgrade to the Haas. Now, I thought I'd start off talking about, ha about the Haas, not looking at one of the upgrades, just looking at a really interesting detail of their front wing. This has been on the car since early in the season. We just didn't really talk about it enough. But have a look here at these elements and how they pick up on the front wing end plate. And these link sections here. This is a trend sort of started by Mercedes where you have this sort of open section at the back and the wing elements which have to by regulation meet the end plate are sort of not really elements at all in the linkages. It's, it's kind of tenuous as the team is sort of trying to generate a bit of outwash and normally I don't like saying what aerodynamic parts do without having a look at the aerodata or having a look in the wind tunnel because essentially you're just making it up if you don't know but look at the shape of these parts here. It is pretty clear what their team are trying to get the airflow to do. And as you roll this clip forwards, you can really get a good look at how those linkage link sections between the front wing end plate and the front wing are really working. Just look here, look, you can really see that shape of how they're trying to channel the air out around the front wheel. That's an outwashing front wing end plate, something the current regulations were trying to get away from, the teams being teams, found a little way around it. Well, the teams being teams also bring big update packages. And this is something Haas has changed fundamentally for the 2024 season. Rather than just bringing one big package during the year and saying upgrades are overrated, the Chinese Grand Prix sees Haas bringing in its first major package to the car. And to explain why Haas have changed its strategy, well, 
Let's go back down to the pit lane a little bit earlier in the season. We are trying to bring uh, updates as, as soon as possible. If you have a big package, you have to wait uh, a lot of time. So, as in the end, uh, if you bring stuff early, you add value to it because you can use for more races. So, we define like a minimum target that we have set. And uh, when we reach this target, we try to bring uh, the update to the track. That's a pretty fundamental change in direction for a team then and how they develop the car. And to take a look at some of the specific new parts bought in Shanghai, Alex Brundle is in the pit lane again. So it's a significant set of upgrades for the uh, VF24. And uh, I'm here with Joao Jeanette, uh, aero performance engineer here at Haas. Uh, to, to talk through what is a, a relatively large package that, that you've brought to Shanghai. So, shall we go from the, the front to the rear of the car in terms of uh, the changes that you've made and, and what you aim to achieve with those changes? Yeah, obviously we have uh, the biggest part of our upgrade is our floor. Uh, the front of the floor is a little bit revised. Um, we also have an, a new mirror, just a little bit kind of smaller footprint. And then at the rear we have a, a, a different bodywork. Uh, it's basically about kind of tuning the details of the big philosophy change we did last year. Uh, now it's more about finding the, 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 the performance and the details. And, and in terms of the edge of the floor, presumably the aim is to try to achieve a, more of a seal down the side of the Venturi to then seal the floor better and get better, better extraction. Yeah, and clean up the losses off of that as well a little bit. Um, in, in terms of the mirror, a little bit smaller, obviously regulated in terms of their size, but you're, you're maximizing that now. Uh, is that a big gain um, in terms of maximizing the rear wing performance in the rear of the car? Every little bit helps. I mean, it's, it will reduce the losses going to the back of the car. It's not nothing groundbreaking, just trying to, to clean things up a little bit. And the, the final part of the, the rear bodywork inside the rear wheel, um, a little bit of an aim to try to uh, increase local downforce production. Talk me through local downforce production as opposed to general uh, downforce uh, production. Yeah, generally speaking, with the, the load you make on the rear corner, there's a bit of a, sometimes a bit of a trade between the local load you make on the wheel and then the effect that has on the floor. So it's about playing with that balance um, and the balance shifts as the what you do in the front of the car changes what happens at the rear as well. Taking a closer look at some of those parts we just heard talked about, look, I want to have a look at right. This is the old specification rear view mirror on the Haas. Haas only introduced the upgrade package to one of their cars and the other car had the old package on so they could compare or they just didn't have enough parts built in time. Probably a bit of both going on. Now look at the shape and design of the mirror housing here. This is the part the team are talking about that they've reduced the width of or reduced the size of ever so slightly. Now the regulations do limit what you can do in terms of the size of the mirror glass but the housing around it there's a little bit of aerodynamic play to be done there. So this is the old specification and here is the new specification. I mean it's a very difficult game of spot the difference. The team say it's been reshaped ever so slightly. I have to say I can't really tell the difference on that so maybe that's one for everybody at home to uh, have a look at and Hashtag F1 Live, tell us what we've missed. But maybe it's, is it a little bit shorter from here to here? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's a pretty subtle change, but sometimes those subtle changes make all of the difference. And speaking of those subtle changes that make all of the difference, the uh, Alpine team have bought a change that's visually fairly subtle but in terms of performance is fairly fundamental. And having a really fascinating detailed chat about it, Alex Brundle is again in the pit lane with the team. A significant floor upgrade brought only to the car of Esteban Ocon uh, for the A524. Uh, I'm joined by Technical Director of Performance, Kyron Pillbeam, uh, to explain the stages of the changes uh, through the floor uh, here at Alpine. So, if you're happy to start at the front for us, Kyron, and, uh, and tell us what's gone on with the, the floor fences towards the front of the car. Yeah, so these, um, the main change is to the most inboard uh, one of the fences. Uh, so it's now sort of comes in further and is attached to the chassis in a different position to where it was before. So it comes with some required modifications to the chassis as well, as well as the new floor. 
what's the aim of, of the modification? Is it just a pure efficiency downforce change or are you are you moving balance of, of downforce? It's it's primarily just an increase in downforce, yeah. So it affects the flow at the beginning of the floor but all the way down the rest of the floor as well. But it's it's not a significant balance change, it's, it's just more aero performance. Talking generally. about the flow down the edge of the floor, it's a change as well to the to the floor edge. Um, what's the aim of, uh, of that? Just better ceiling along the edge of the floor, a different concept? Uh, it's not really a different concept, but it is a, a different detail, and this, this is quite a sensitive area for aero performance, which is why you can see so much detail on here and on the other car's floor edges, and it affects the flow, again, particularly into that area around the rear tyre, which is very sensitive to controlling what goes on in the diffuser further down the car. There's a change as well in that area uh, on the inside of the rear tire. Yeah. Just explain to us if you can what you've what you've changed in there. It, yes, it's a small detail. We call it the letterbox. It's in sort of the beginning of the diffuser sidewall, I suppose you'd call it. Um, again, this area is very sensitive to uh, the flow that comes off the bottom of the tire when it's rotating, and it, it affects what goes on in the in the diffuser. That's the primary reason for this change. Fascinating stuff there from Alex in the pit lane. And this, I just want to take a closer look at the parts they were talking about. This is the new floor that Kyron Pilbin was indicating to you. You can see the new cutout just at the back there with this metal insert along it. But there's also a revised section along the floor edge here. That's quite important. And you can see what the team are sort of trying to do. And when you compare it to the old specif specification car, the detail change is pretty obvious. Look here, you've got a completely flat rear edge and completely flat. Here's that letterbox section that they were talking about as well. You can see that's all pretty continuous compared back to the old version. And you can see those shape changes very clear. Yes, the rear section is slightly changed, but this bit is completely different and completely new. And that's something the team is hopefully going to get a bit more performance out of and move a bit further forward on the field. Interesting to hear them say that it requires modification to the chassis to fit that floor. I don't quite understand why that is, and the team haven't really been detailed enough about it, but they're not going to show us the full detail of their floor because that's the holy of holies and the secret of secrets. However, something that isn't the secret of secrets is the revised front wing that the team introduced a few races ago. And here you can see it. And we've already talked about the Haas front wing. We'll talk about the trends forming in Formula One. Again, these remote elements, not quite as advanced as the Haas front wing here on the Alpine, but clearly pursuing that same direction. And when you compare it to the old specification front wing, that's essentially traditional going back to the 2022 generation of cars, you can see those elements very much, very clearly joining the main front wing end plate. And that's what everybody sort of expected. But then you go and see that new version and you can see the direction of travel and the trend, the engineering trend in Formula One. And sticking on front wings, I wanted to take a look at Williams. Well, they changed their front wing for Suzuka. And the Williams team had a really interesting front wing end plate dive plane de design previously. And you can see this panel around here that the team have inserted into the end plate. And they've now gone for a fairly conventional dive plane, this sort of S-shaped section on the front wing end plate. But previously they had a big blocky wedge shape, which is something quite unlike anything we've seen in F1. They used it for the opening races and moved away from it with their new front wing. But on that trend of the inboard section and the front wing elements joining the end plate, well, Williams, again, they're another team that's gone for a fairly advanced solution. You can see it here. They've got a little winglet that sticks in, a sticky inny bit, if you like, from the front wing end plate. And you can see those rear two elements forming that same shape that we saw on the Haas and we saw on the Alpine. But they're only doing it with the rear two elements and not the front two. So that's a bit of departure from other teams. And you can put, compare that to their old design, which again is just very simple, all those big elements joining the front wing end plate as you expect. But to detail some of those more substantial changes to the Williams, Alex Brundle was with Dave Robson from the team to discuss some of those detail changes they made in Shanghai. We did some flow biz on this a um, couple of races ago, actually, which you'd probably be able to see if you look back to P1 in, I think it's probably Melbourne, and, and it wasn't, the, the flow structures weren't quite what we hoped for, so we've just been able to clean that up and um, yeah as you say we should see that reflected in, in how the rear of the car works. This part of the fairing um, is updated on, on Alex's car and that's really just about um, controlling the, the flow that comes around the cockpit, cleaning it up and making sure that it then goes down to uh, 
the area at the back of the car where it, it does the least amount of, of damage. So if that all works as intended, Alex's car should see a, a small increase in, in aerodynamic efficiency this weekend. This, the sort of depth and the angle of attack of, of this part of the, the forward part of the, the halo shroud is, is quite different. The rest of it is all the same. It's, it's just this area here, but it, um, it should be quite powerful in say, in terms of cleaning up that flow. Rear downforce and, and the, the, the rear aerodynamic elements are really the, the, the critical part of maximizing this regulation set, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. So the main thing the halo will do will, will impact the rear wing, but of course the rear wing through the, through the beam wing and the rear suspension all interacts with, with the diffuser. So the whole thing works, works as a system. So yeah, everything up here, all about controlling that flow and conditioning it to make sure it works properly at the back. While Williams has made some changes around the halo of Alex Albon's car, Logan Sargent's car highlights a little element that I thought was quite interesting to take a look at because there's another one of these F1 trends that is evolving. Take a look at this triangular section at the rear of the halo mount where the driver's name is located. That's something that quite a few teams have been experimenting with and Williams is one of them. Well, it may come as a surprise to everybody, but it's also a direction that the Mercedes team has only just embarked upon. And here you can see they've introduced these fairly hastily manufactured fins that they've put in the same part of the rear halo. A bit further forwards on the, on the Mercedes and a bit further up, but actually there's an area of technical freedom around the halo and that's why some teams have these elements on the top of the halo. As long as you're within a certain, almost like a tube around the outer part of the halo, as long as you're within a set of dimensions, you can do quite a few aerodynamic elements around the edge of that. And that's what Mercedes are exploiting with this new, well, long sticky uppy bit, if you like, on the top of the halo. You can see it's been fairly quickly manufactured because it's just a single piece of carbon fiber that's been trimmed to shape, single ply, and it's not even been painted. It's not about weight that. I think that's just about the time to get it there, get it glued onto the car and hope it improves the performance ever so slightly. I mean, it's not gonna make a big difference, but all of these little improvements add up. And all those little improvements you see to Formula One cars across the season, don't just improve the car's performance around the lap all year long and make them a bit more competitive. All of those learnings, all of those technical lessons, whether they work or whether they don't, do have a wider impact on the whole world. And to discuss exactly that impact that Formula One is having, well, we put together a little video. Have a look at this. The kids are really excited, we were excited. It's such an amazing sport, we're amazing people. It's another example of F1 ingenuity that's gonna change the world. Utilising HVO fuels in our truck fleet has resulted in an 83% reduction in our carbon emissions. In Austria, we launched a sustainable energy pilot that allowed us to reduce the carbon footprint by around 90%. Last season, all F2 and F3 cars used 55% advanced sustainable fuels in partnership with Aramco. Formula One is this industry which is advancing the most you're actually having an impact. There's a real willingness from within this paddock to drive impact for change. We're really reaching the next generation, raising awareness and getting more talent into the sport. I think it's wonderful that we have this opportunity. I want to become an engineer now. These are obviously the next generation of fans, next generation of engineers. If we can inspire them at a young age, yeah, it's brilliant. It's just been a fantastic opportunity to open their eyes to see what is possible. Now I realise there's more to Formula One than actual driving. It definitely has inspired me. So many moments where I'm just like, wow. I've just grown so much, it's going to be very invaluable for my future. Such a big opportunity and I'm so grateful for it. We've got all the teams involved, we've got the FIA involved. This is in the common good. It's good for the sport and it's good for the industry. This is an F1 initiative that allows those who may not usually have the opportunity to meet drivers and experience the paddock. Bonjour Pierre. Wow, impressed. <laughs> Thank you Charlie, thanks for the support. We are on track to be net zero 2030 after making great progress. And there is a lot more to come. Avanti tutto, full speed ahead. 
Well, if you want to take a look at the full report, it's available now on the Formula One website. I thoroughly recommend everyone has a good read of it and view the videos that are linked to it. It is absolutely fascinating. It shows a really positive direction of travel for a sport that is currently changing the world. Well, will these updates change the World Championship? Well, we'll have to wait and see as the season goes on.